Hello students, welcome to Baiju's classes. One of the issues that has been plaguing the Indian banking sector in the last couple of years has been the issue of non-performing assets. As per the report of the World Bank, non-performing assets comprised of 2.6% of the total loans issued by the banking sector in the year 2011. And by the year 2016, the non-performing assets of the Indian banking sector have increased to more than 9.1%. That is, in a span of five years, uh, the NPAs in case of India have more than tripled. Now, to control the menace of the non-performing asset, uh, Government of India as well as RBI have implemented uh, a host of reforms. Uh, and one of the biggest reforms that was implemented by Government of India in December 2016 uh, is the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code. So, in this video lecture, uh, we will have a detailed discussion on uh, Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code. The areas of coverage in this particular video will be, we'll start with uh, what is the basic idea of uh, insolvency and uh, basic concept of a uh, bankruptcy. And uh, we'll study what was the need of having a consolidated uh, code that is insolvency and bankruptcy code. Third, uh, we will study the provisions uh, and the process that has been prescribed under uh, the code. We'll make a comparison between uh, India's code as well as UK's code. For a simple reason, UK's code is considered to be one of the best working models of insolvency resolution process. Then we will study what has been the progress or the implementation of the code in the last one year. And finally, we will have a discussion regarding the ordinance that was promulgated by the President of India very recently, which basically amends the two sections of the code. Now, let me start with the basic concept of insolvency and bankruptcy. To explain this, uh, let me take up an example uh, in a market. Let's assume A is a manufacturer who has taken a loan from a bank B and has also taken and purchased certain raw materials from a vendor C. Now, the bank B has given a credit to A as well as the vendor C has also provided raw materials to A on credit. Now, technically speaking, A will be referred to as a borrower or debtor and B and C will be referred to as creditors. Now, as per insolvency and bankruptcy code, in the market, there are two types of creditors. One is referred to as a financial creditor and second is referred to as operational creditor. A financial creditor is the one who has provided or has given loans for certain consideration. That is, the financial creditor accepts a certain collateral or takes a certain collateral from the borrower and in turn will give a loan to the borrower. And since he collects a collateral, right, he is also referred to as a secured creditor. Whereas in case of an operational creditor, he provides goods or services on credit to the buyer in the market. And since he has provided it on the credit, he is expecting certain payment from the buyer in the market. And since he is not taking any kind of a collateral before giving the credit to the buyer, he is referred to as unsecured creditor in the market. So in this particular example, bank B becomes a financial creditor and C becomes an operational creditor. Now, be it a financial creditor or operational creditor, both of them are expecting payments from the buyer or the borrower in the market. For whatever reasons, let's assume A is unable to make the repayments to bank B or make the payments to the creditor C. Now, this inability of making repayments to the creditors is referred to as a concept of insolvency. Again, the inability of the borrower to make repayments to the creditors is called as insolvency. And to resolve this insolvency, we'll follow a legal process or a legal framework which is referred to as a bankruptcy. So, this is a basic idea of what is insolvency and what is bankruptcy. Now, what was the need of having a consolidated framework that is insolvency and bankruptcy code? Now, before IBC, there were different laws or different legislative pieces which took care of insolvency resolution in case of corporate borrowers and in case of retail borrowers. In case of corporate borrowers, there were laws such as Companies Act of 1956, Companies Act of 2013, and SICA 1985, that is the SIC Industrial Companies Act of 1985. Whereas in case of retail borrowers or individual borrowers, there were laws such as Surface Act, Surface Act of 2002, and Recovery of a Debt Due to Banks and Financial Institutions Act of 1993. Now, Surface Act basically stands for Securitization and Reconstruction of Financial Assets and Enforcement of Security Interest Act. And uh, recovery of a debt due to banks and financial institutions uh, basically gave rise to the quasi-judicial bodies of uh, debt recovery tribunals. Uh, 
Now, rather than having uh, this kind of a fragmented legislative framework, uh, IBC provides uh, right, a single framework for resolving insolvency for both retail borrowers as well as corporate borrowers. Second, uh, the time required for completion of insolvency resolution was very high and uh, second, uh, the recovery rates uh, were very low in case of India. That is, uh, as per a survey that was conducted by Alvarez and Marcel, uh, right, the time required for completion of insolvency proceedings uh, in India was somewhere around 4.3 years. Uh, and uh, the recovery rates uh, which basically represent uh, how much of the loan or uh, how much of the debt uh, is uh, recovered by the creditors uh, once the insolvency resolution proceedings are done. Uh, recovery rates in case of India were very low and were hovering at around 25.7. Uh, and usually the recovery rates are represented in the form of uh, cents to dollars that is uh, for every one dollar that is given in the form of a credit or the loan uh, how much is recovered in the form of a cents uh, and obviously higher the recovery rates uh, it is better for the creditors in the market uh, now basically on comparison you will realize that uh, amongst the BRICS economies uh, India is one of the worst performing economies uh, in terms of a uh, recovery or uh, uh, time consumption uh, for recovery and uh, the recovery rates as such. Uh, since uh, the time consumption uh, for insolvency proceedings was very high, we also saw that uh, the non-performing assets uh, in case of the Indian market have kept on climbing up in the last couple of years. Uh, as already mentioned, uh, the World Bank report uh, cites that uh, the non-performing assets uh, were around 2.6% of the total loans issued uh, in the year 2011 uh, and uh, by 2016, uh, these have climbed up to more than 9.1%. Not only this, uh, India is one of the economies amongst the BRICS community which is sitting on a huge pile of non-performing assets. Uh, now this uh, non-performing asset rise uh, is uh, despite RBI taking many measures in the last couple of years uh, such as uh, strategic debt restructuring, such as uh, S4A that is a scheme for a sustainable structuring of a stressed assets, uh, such as uh, uh, 5 is to 25 reforms, uh, asset quality review, etc. Now, despite having taken so many measures, uh, the non-performing assets in the Indian economy have kept on climbing uh, and there is an adverse effect of uh, this increase in the non-performing assets on the whole economy. The impacts are uh, such as uh, the lending rates usually keep on increasing. Second, uh, it will affect the investment cycle in the economy as well as the credit cycle of the economy. It will affect uh, the investor confidence uh, uh, on the economy and it will also have a limiting impact uh, on the growth potential of the economy. So these are some of the negative impacts uh, that will be affecting the, the economy because of the high NPAs. Uh, now with the passage of insolvency and bankruptcy code, uh, we can say that uh, the non-performing assets uh, will be resolved uh, within a time frame of uh, 180 days uh, and uh, the recovery rates will also increase. Uh, fourth, the ease of doing business. The present government of India is giving a lot of importance to the concept of ease of doing business. And this is represented by India's ranking in the ease of doing business report which is published annually by the World Bank. In this particular report, World Bank basically ranks various countries based on their performance on the 10 parameters. One of the parameters that is usually considered is resolving insolvency. With the implementation of IBC, we have seen that the government of India or the India's ranking under this particular report has improved over a period of time. In 2016, India was ranked at 136th position in this particular parameter. And as per the latest report, that is for 2018, India's ranking under this particular parameter has improved to 103rd position. And overall, on the 10 parameters, India's ranking has improved to 100th position. So we have seen that, uh, that with the implementation of IBC, India's ranking under this particular report has increased over a period of time. Now let's look at uh, the provisions or the features of the insolvency and bankruptcy code. It basically introduces uh, to the concept of a creditor in control regime. That is, before IBC was implemented, uh, the debtor used to file for insolvency but used to continue to own uh, the assets of the particular company or the borrowing company as such. Uh, but under the new regime, uh, once the creditors lose the faith in the repayment capacity of the borrower, they can simply approach the NCLT and file for insolvency resolution process. And not only this, once the case has been accepted and admitted by the NCLT, the insolvency professional will be made in charge of the company as such. Next, with the passage of IBC, it has led to establishing three types of authorities. One is Insolvency and Bankruptcy Board of India, which will ensure that all the stakeholders in the process of insolvency resolution will abide by the provisions of the IBC. Second, 
insolvency professionals uh, who are the experts in conducting insolvency resolution process. Uh, third, information utilities. Uh, these are the central repositories of uh, financial as well as uh, credit related information of the borrowers. Uh, apart from uh, these three authorities, uh, there is involvement of uh, two quasi-judicial bodies as such. Uh, one is uh, the debt recovery tribunal which will take up uh, insolvency resolution cases of uh, individual borrowers uh, and second one is a uh, national company law tribunal uh, which will take up uh, the insolvency resolution cases of the corporate borrowers. Uh, apart from this, uh, the insolvency resolution uh, has to be provided within a time period of 180 days. Uh, now this uh, time period of 180 days is also referred to as a moratorium period. Uh, and during this particular moratorium period, uh, no further cases uh, will be accepted against uh, this particular company and second, uh, no recovery proceedings uh, can be conducted against uh, this particular company. Now having said so, the moratorium period uh, can also be extended uh, by another 90 days uh, which is the prerogative of the insolvency professional. Now what is the idea of insolvency resolution here? Uh, insolvency resolution basically means uh, either the creditors will decide uh, to sell this particular company to a new buyer in a market uh, who is also referred to as a resolution applicant uh, or else uh, they will come to a decision uh, to liquidate the company. Apart from this, uh, the provisions of uh, insolvency and bankruptcy code are not applicable to financial institutions or financial firms. Uh, in case of insolvency resolution in these particular firms, uh, the government of India has very recently introduced uh, the FRDI bill that stands for a financial resolution and deposit insurance bill which is in a lot of discussion because of a provision of a bail-in which has been provided under the bill. So these are the features of the provisions uh, under the code. Um, having uh, looked at these, uh, let's have a look at uh, what is the process that has been provided for insolvency resolution process uh, under this particular code. Uh, the first step is uh, either the creditor or the debtor will approach the adjudicating authority. Now since we are focused more about uh, the corporate uh, insolvency resolution, uh, Let's say, right, uh, the, the creditors uh, will be either financial creditors uh, or uh, operational creditors uh, and these will approach uh, National Company Law Tribunal. Uh, once they have approached NCLT and filed a case of insolvency resolution, uh, within the next 14 days, uh, NCLT either has to accept and admit the case uh, or else has to reject the case. Uh, once accepted, uh, NCLT will appoint uh, insolvency professional who is uh, made uh, in charge of the operations of the company. Second, he will appoint a committee of creditors uh, that is basically the committee of uh, financial creditors uh, and third, uh, he will seek uh, financial as well as a uh, credit related information uh, from uh, information utilities uh, and provide it to committee of creditors. Uh, now the committee of creditors uh, is given a moratorium period or a time period of 180 days uh, during which uh, they are expected to deliberate, discuss uh, and come to a decision uh, of insolvency resolution. That is uh, either sell the company to a buyer in a market uh, or else uh, liquidate the company. Now if the committee of creditors are unable to come to a decision uh, within 180 days, uh, then the insolvency professional can provide uh, extra 90 days uh, to deliberate uh, and come to a decision. Uh, and whenever the decision is uh, done by committee of creditors, uh, the decision can be done uh, through consensus or voting. Uh, under consensus, uh, all the creditors agree to a particular decision. Uh, whereas in case of voting, uh, we require at least 75% of a creditors by value. That is, uh, the creditors who want a decision to be agreed by the committee of creditors uh, should cumulatively have given uh, at least 75% of the debt to the borrower in this particular scenario. Next, uh, if the committee of creditors come to a decision, the insolvency professional will basically convey the decision to the adjudicating authority that is NCLT in this particular scenario and NCLT will issue an order uh, giving an effect to the decision of the committee of creditors. Uh, and if the committee of creditors do not come to a decision uh, either at the end of 180 days or at the end of uh, 270 days, uh, then insolvency professional by default uh, will give a recommendation of liquidating uh, the company to the adjudicating authority and the adjudicating authority will issue an order uh, giving effect to this particular recommendation. Uh, this is the basic process that has been uh, prescribed uh, under insolvency and bankruptcy code uh, for uh, conducting insolvency resolution process. Uh, let's make a comparison between uh, UK's law as well as India's law. Now this comparison is very important for a simple reason, uh, UK's code is considered to be one of the best working models of uh, insolvency resolution process uh, amongst uh, the global markets as such. Uh, now let me start with uh, the similarities then we will have a look at the differences. Uh, in both the codes uh, or in both the laws uh, basically 
they follow the concept of a creditor in control. Under both the laws, uh, the insolvency resolution process uh, can be initiated uh, either by the creditor or by the debtor. Now, insolvency professional, once he is appointed, uh, he is the in charge of the operations uh, of the company. And finally, under both the codes, uh, there is a concept of a moratorium period. Now, let's have a look at uh, the differences in the provisions uh, between two codes. Uh, one, if the insolvency professional has to be appointed under UK's code, uh, he has to provide a bond uh, whose value is equivalent to the value of the assets under consideration, that is, uh, the company's assets. Uh, this particular provision has been implemented so as to ensure that uh, the insolvency professional does not uh, get involved in uh, fraudulent practices. Uh, whereas, in case of India, there is no provision of uh, providing uh, the bond in case of insolvency professional. Next, uh, once the insolvency professional is appointed, uh, under UK's law, he has got more autonomy or more powers uh, to take care of the operations uh, by implementing various decisions uh, in case of UK. Once the insolvency professional is appointed, uh, he has got more autonomy under the UK's law to take care of uh, the operations and take the decisions uh, in case of operations of the company. Now, under India's code, uh, at various scenarios, uh, the insolvency professional is supposed to take approvals from the committee of creditors uh, in order uh, to take decisions uh, uh, to ensure the operations of the company. Next, uh, in case of a moratorium period, uh, under India's law, the moratorium period has been fixed at uh, either 180 days, uh, which can be extended by another 90 days. Uh, whereas, in case of UK's code, uh, there is no fixed time period as such. And finally, in terms of voting, uh, under India's code, uh, only the financial creditors uh, will form the committee of creditors and are given the right to vote. Whereas in case of UK, all the creditors, uh, be it financial creditors or operational creditors, uh, will participate uh, in the insolvency resolution and also are given uh, the right to vote. These are the basic differences as well as the similarities between UK's code and India's code. Now, what has been the implementation of IBC in the last one year? It has been seen that uh, more than 1000 cases have been filed under IBC in the last one year of which uh, more than 400 cases have been uh, admitted by adjudicating authorities. Uh, if I dissect this particular number that is 400 cases, uh, what we find is uh, around 47% of the cases uh, have been filed by operational creditors, uh, around 32% have been filed by financial creditors uh, and the remaining part uh, that is 21% of the cases uh, have been filed by the debtors themselves. Uh, this number that is 47% of the operational creditors uh, is uh, very important for a simple reason uh, before IBC. Since operational creditors uh, do not have any kind of a collateral, uh, it was very difficult for these kind of a creditors uh, to get the payments from the companies uh, which are under financial stress. Uh, but under the IBC, irrespective of whether you are an operational creditor or a financial creditor, if you lose faith on the repayment ability of the borrower, you can simply approach NCLT and file for insolvency resolution process. So what we can see is in the last one year, on an average, more than three cases have been filed under the code on daily basis. And of these cases, right, one case has been admitted by the adjudicating authorities. Having said so, the implementation of the IBC is being plagued by some of the issues such as the taxation issue, withdrawal issue, moratorium period issue, as well as the recent ordinance issue. In case of a taxation issue, there is a provision which basically states that uh, the new buyer has to pay 35% tax uh, on the debt that has been uh, discounted by the committee of creditors. Uh, that is, uh, let's assume here is a company A which owed uh, overall 100 crore rupees uh, to committee of creditors. Uh, and the committee of creditors decide to sell this particular company to a buyer in the market that is B at a discounted price of 60 crore rupees. Now as per the provision, basically it states that the company B has bought an asset whose value is 100 crores at a value of 60 crore rupees and in turn is enjoying a profit of 40 crore rupees and they are expected to pay 35% tax on this particular savings or the profit of 40 crore rupees. This particular provision has been opposed by various stakeholders in the market. Second, experts feel that the moratorium period of 180 days should be fixed at 270 days and thereafter extra 90 days a time period can be given. This increase in the moratorium period will increase the recovery of the creditors and will also reduce the non-performing assets in the market as such. Next, we will have a look at uh, the ordinance that has been promulgated uh, by the President of India in the recent time. Uh, this particular ordinance basically amends uh, the IBC and uh, adds uh, two sections to this code. Uh, one section is uh, section 235A and the other section is uh, 29A. Section 235A basically introduces uh, punishment 
in case of uh, infringement or violation of any of the provisions of the code. And section 29A basically prohibits uh, some of the people from participating in the insolvency resolution process. That is, uh, some of the people will not be allowed to act as a resolution applicants uh, during insolvency resolution process. Uh, the people which are being prohibited uh, right, as per this particular ordinance uh, are those who have been declared as uh, willful defaulters uh, or those uh, who have been uh, declared as uh, insolvent or uh, whose accounts have been classified as an NPA for a period of uh, at least one year those uh, who have been convicted of an offence uh, which attracts uh, a jail punishment of at least uh, two years, uh, those who have been disqualified by SEBI and those uh, who are the promoters of the companies which have uh, filed for insolvency and the connected people of uh, these particular companies. Uh, so these are the kinds of uh, persons uh, who are not allowed to participate in the insolvency resolution process uh, as per this particular ordinance. Uh, let's evaluate the implications of this particular ordinance. Uh, let me start with the positives. Uh, in the market, there was a fear amongst the creditors that uh, some of the promoters of the companies uh, who have to pay huge amount of uh, loans back to the creditors uh, will ensure that their companies will enter into losses, uh, then file for uh, insolvency and repurchase uh, their own companies uh, from the committee of creditors at a very high discount. Uh, the example that has been quoted by various experts uh, with respect to this uh, is the case of uh, Synergies Dure. Synergies Dure, a Hyderabad based company had a total outstanding liability of uh, more than 900 crore rupees. Uh, the promoters of this particular company file for uh, insolvency and repurchase the company from the committee of creditors uh, at a discounted price of uh, 54 crore rupees. Uh, that is, uh, the committee of creditors uh, were forced to take a huge haircut of 846 crore rupees uh, and uh, the promoters uh, reduced their liability to a party sum that is uh, 54 crore rupees. Uh, with the passage of this ordinance, uh, these kind of uh, sales will not be allowed uh, as uh, the promoters will not be allowed to participate in the insolvency resolution process. Second, the ordinance will introduce transparency in the insolvency resolution process uh, which will also help in attracting uh, foreign players in the Indian market. Uh, not only this, uh, this will also promote uh, prompt repayments uh, on the part of the promoters uh, failing which uh, the operational creditor or a financial creditor can simply approach NCLT and file for insolvency resolution proceedings. Having said so, some of the experts have also raised concerns with the provisions that have been implemented under this particular ordinance. Some of their concerns are, first, India is the only country to have such a stringent provision. Second, insolvency resolution is a commercial process. Since it is a commercial process, the committee of creditors must be given autonomy or a free hand to choose any proposal which will provide them with the highest recovery. Now, this particular, prompo, this particular proposal could be of the previous promoters of the company or could be of a new buyer in the market. Third, with the blanket ban being imposed on many people from participating in the insolvency resolution process, the number of competitors in the market are going to come down. When the number of competitors are going to come down, the proposals will also come down, which will affect uh, the recovery process of uh, the banking sector and it will also affect uh, the price of discovery of the asset. As a result of which, uh, now the banks will be forced to sell the companies uh, or the assets uh, at a very high discount. And finally, the ordinance uh, does not differentiate between uh, companies uh, which have entered into losses uh, because of various external factors as well as internal factors uh, which are beyond their control. Uh, compared to a company where the promoters willingly took a wrong decision and ensured that their company will enter into losses. That is, the ordinance does not differentiate between bad decision making with wrong decision making. So, this is the basic evaluation of the implications of the ordinance which has been promulgated. In conclusion, we can say that insolvency and bankruptcy code is a revolutionary reform which will reduce the non-performing assets uh, since uh, there is a time-bound insolvency resolution process provided under this uh, and second uh, will give uh, control in the hands of the creditors uh, and third uh, will prohibit uh, malfeasance uh, in case of uh, insolvency resolution process. Uh, but having said so, it also must be noted that uh, the process is suffering from certain issues uh, which the government of India must uh, plug uh, in the upcoming uh, budget session uh, to ensure that uh, the insolvency resolution process uh, is conducted very well and a recovery increase over a period of time. Thank you.